Okay, everybody, welcome to another edition of the Orthodox Nationalist. Uh, today, uh, we're going to deal with something that's of immense importance to me, something that I've been, uh, I've concerned myself with for a long time, and that is a reasonable and rational defense of agrarianism and the agrarian life. In fact, over the last few years, most of my, um, political and philosophical vision has now found itself being resolved around the question of the agrarian world and the regeneration of small towns. This is this is very much an American issue where uh, most of the small farmland has been destroyed, has been taken over by two major firms, Archer Daniels Midland, which is one of the main architects of globalism, from the American point of view, and uh, ConAgra. And the U.S. Department of Agriculture has made a deal, both with ConAgra and ADM, that they will divide uh, American uh, farmland between the two. And they go state by state as to which uh, areas they will put out of commission and then take over. So um, it, it is quite legitimately a federal government movement along with ADM and ConAgra to destroy American small town life and American small farms. None of this is accidental. It has to do with complete federalization of um, the food supply. In the process, Archer Daniels Midland and ConAgra have dumped American grain and other American foodstuffs on the market, especially in Latin America, with the idea of driving their small farmers out of business. The irony of all of this is that ConAgra and Archer Daniels Midland dump American grain and other food on the Latin American market, dump in its in its literal sense, you know, below market value. It's already very cheap to begin with. As a result of that, millions of small farmsteads are destroyed. As a result of that, Archer Daniels Midland then brings millions of immigrants from Mexico and, and points south to work on their corporate farms. It's not an accident that Archer Daniels Midland is a major player in the pro-immigration movement, in the globalist movement, supports left-wing movements around the globe, is deep in um, uh, the Soros organization and movement and has been a major player in bringing as many of these now landless immigrants from Latin America to work uh, essentially for slave wages on, um, on, their, on their mega farms, on their corporate farms. Archer Daniels Midland and the destruction of the small farm world in Latin America is a substantial component of immigration, both legal and illegal immigration from Mexico and the remainder of um, uh, Spanish and Portuguese speaking uh, uh, America. So the destruction of small farms has meant a whole bunch of things. It's meant the uh, swelling of urban populations. It's meant the destruction of millions of small towns in America. The destruction of communities all over the globe, not just in the United States, but it's also meant that these agricultural megacorporations, very close to the American government, highly subsidized by the American government, are very much a part of uh, the uh, legal and illegal immigration into America. Uh, these guys are not working in small farms. These guys are coming and are being um, are, are being employed for almost starvation wages by the big agricultural giants, uh, especially from uh, Texas and that belt of states heading northward, Oklahoma, Kansas, etc. And it has, it, it's brought destruction to the small farms of the world and these small farms are the backbone of economic growth throughout the globe. Without the understanding of the role of small farms in national economic development, you don't understand national economic development. 
when we talk about small farms, we're talking about a widely diffused ownership of property and self-sufficiency in terms of food and labor and a lifestyle that is infinitely um, uh, uh, healthier and more virtuous than the urban lifestyle is. Now, I, I want to talk about this topic because I, uh, I've i lived in all environments. I've lived in an urban environment. I was born and raised in a suburban environment. And I've also lived in a rural environment. On top of that, I've also lived on uh, a beach environment, which is also uh, often uh, referred to as a form of, of rural living. So I've lived in all four um environments and i'm here to tell you that there is nothing there is nothing more satisfying than the rural life and uh the small farm existence i live uh and will die now here in amish country in uh southern pennsylvania and the amish uh, populations are slowly disappearing and there is one very good reason why the Amish populations in Pennsylvania are disappearing. And that is because more and more Amish people have embraced economic and technical modernity. The Amish in my neighborhood uh, drive cars. They had cell phones before I had cell phones. And in this part of the world, only 10% of the Amish people make their living in agriculture. Once they embraced modernity, once they decided to embrace the American way of life, they learned things that they never knew before. They learned what debt was. They learned what usury was. And because of their embrace of technology, in this part of the world, in this part of the state, their young people are leaving in large volumes to go to the city and uh, lead the secular uh, bohemian life that the cities are um, the cities are known for. Cities came into existence so that capital can have a easy to find and easy to mobilize pool of labor. That's what a city is. A city is a radically unnatural, extremely stressful element on the natural uh, on the natural environment. It is a parasite. The earth or the human mind was never meant to live with this level of sensory overload. And the literature on this stuff is actually pretty amazing. The human brain cannot normally or naturally process the absurd level of sensory input in terms of communication and social interaction that exists and the speed that it exists in an urban environment. And this has been linked to schizophrenia, it's been linked to bipolarity, it's been linked to depression that the urban mind is constantly in sensory overload. And this leads to extreme levels of stress and all sorts of psycho, uh, psychophysical um, uh, problems. The urban world is unnatural. There is no infrastructure that can properly process the level of building and the level of sewage and the level of waste that a megacity can produce. And city dwellers, I was one at one time, have just gotten used to the filth and death around them. And these idiots come out into the country and they smell uh, manure and they say, oh, how terrible this is. And they only say that because they're used to the horrible stenches of the urban environment, whether it be from pollution or from car exhaust uh, or from the the overstress of the sewage system, 
Uh, they've just kind of, you know, gotten used to this over the years. I think one of the central elements in regenerating Western societies is the economic revitalization of small towns. My experience in small town life, I live in a small town now, there is very little crime. The fact is, is that the, um, the, the polling data that exists, not just in America, but around the world, shows that rural people have far more lasting relationships, whether it be in terms of marriage or in terms of friendship or in terms of civic organization, than uh, urban people do. Civic organizations are stronger and less fluid in rural America than in urban America. And contrary to all the Jewish media mythology about rural people being ignorant, the fact is, is that according to the federal government of the United States, Department of Education, uh, small town test scores in science and math are higher than in urban areas. Teachers in rural schools stay longer and have higher rates of job satisfaction than uh, urban teachers do or suburban teachers do. There is also substantially less depression and mental illness in um, rural areas than either suburban or urban areas. Needless to say, of course, you know, the benefits of rural living include much lower taxes, cheaper homes, more land, and more land that's, you know, much less expensive, and, and as a result of that, far more privacy and solitude than you would have in an urban environment. Uh, less well known, I mean, those are fairly well known advantages of country living, but less well known is the fact that the bureaucratic mentality doesn't really exist in rural areas. Bureaucracy is usually very small in rural areas and is only used when necessary. And in, uh, in the country environment, there's also substantially less coercion. There is far more freedom in a rural environment simply because most of these communities are more or less self-governing. There are very few, to be honest with you, there, there, there are increasingly less and less uh, uh, rural police departments. And as a result, it's either up to the county or the state to patrol these areas, which means, in real terms, that there are far less government officials, uh, far fewer government officials per person than in uh, urban areas. And simply put, there is a smaller, much smaller, infrastructure of control and coercion in the rural world as there is in the urban world. The urban world is, in America, a police state. The city of Chicago is the first city to completely cover every square inch of its public area under video camera surveillance. That's now been uh, imitated by most American major cities where every street, every sidewalk within the corporate city limits is now under 24-7 video surveillance. That by itself strongly suggests that our people need to leave the city and leave the suburbs, which are now slowly but surely coming under the same regime of surveillance, and move out and revitalize small towns. And the fact is, small town America is offering substantial tax incentives for moving out there, bringing your money and bringing your expertise out to small town America. Small towns and the counties um, that that contain them are fighting back. And they're offering substantial incentives for people to return to their roots, and all of us have roots in the rural world at one point 
uh, in our development or another. This is now uh, the time to do it. The fact is, is that rural labor, poll after poll shows that rural labor is far more satisfied and happy with their life and their situation than in the suburbs or in the rural environment. The fact of the matter is that um, rural populations are happier. And the polling data seems to strongly suggest that rural people, even when they are poorer than suburban or urban people, are happier, are more contented. And one of the reasons for this is a great, a very strong sense of security. If you are poor in an urban environment, you are dependent on the state. If you are poor in a rural environment, you depend on each other. This is a long-standing benefit to um, uh, rural societies that has been grudgingly admitted uh, according to the academic literature on the topic. The main reason that rural people are happier than urban people and suffer less mental illness than urban people the main reason is the sense of security and cooperation, and the two, of course, are very closely related, that rural people have that urban people do not. Teamwork and cooperation is a normal and accepted part of life. It's understood that when you move into a rural area, you are expected to join in various cooperative organizations and societies in the area. Poverty, you know, putting it differently, is a lot easier to bear in the less expensive, more cooperative world of rural America than it is in the high-tax, high-expense world of urban America. Politically speaking, rural communities have a great benefit in that any citizen who is active civically in all the different organizations that rural towns still maintain. Many of you travel through Nebraska and Kansas and Missouri as often as I have, you see that even towns between 500 and 1,500 people have dozens upon dozens of functional civic organizations. These alone are constantly cooperating and assisting people who don't have the normal means of uh, life uh, that they do. The poor are far better taken care of in these areas than in the urban environment where they are dependent upon the state. Any person in rural America, civically organized, civically active, has very easy access to the halls of power. Where I live, I simply wait for my my kids' football games. There I could speak to the mayor. I could speak to a councilman. I could speak to a freeholder. Because they're all there, because their kids or grandkids are all playing there too. I could go sit next to him and I could ask him questions and I could give my opinion. This happens all the time. In fact, it's a normal part of life. This isn't some romantic um, uh, picture painting here. This is the reality of our small town life. I could see uh, my my mayor uh, in the supermarket. You know, and if he gets me mad, well, I'll tailgate his pickup truck and get him really mad. You know, this you know, the political access and, and the, the ability to get your opinions heard uh, is so easy in small town life. You know, a lot of young people, they, they, you know, they're born and raised in small towns and the first thing that they do when they turn 18, 19, 20 is they want to go to the city because they think it's exciting and fast moving and, and they just can't wait, you know. But the statistics show, whether it be the U.S. Department of Labor or the Department of Interior, all the statistics show, federal and state level, that these kids, when they go off to the city because they think it's going to be exciting, 
they are very likely to return to their roots very quickly. They get bored of that fast-paced life very quickly. It does not offer them what they think it offers. And especially when they get married. And if they want to have kids, the first thing that they do is that they do anything in their power to get back to the small towns where they were born and raised. The schools are so far superior here. The schools are safe. The schools are more or less drug-free. Although I want to mention that some of your major drug lords are using small towns as drop-off points because they realize that counties and small towns out in rural America don't have the ability to fight back the way that municipal uh, authorities can in the big cities. Uh, That was the case in the 90s. I think that's died down a little bit now. But I know that in southern Nebraska, uh, a lot of these uh, uh, drug dealers were using small towns because they are under less surveillance there. So um, for this first half of the program, I just want to remind you of the significant benefits of small town life the naturalness of it. In other words, that the human frame and the human mind and the human sensory organs are uh, not attuned to the fast pace of life in urban environments. Sensory overload and overstimulation leading to insomnia and mental illness, this is not an uncommon connection. And there's a substantial literature out there uh, concerning uh, this connection between sensory overload, the human brain being forced to move faster and process information far faster than it was designed to do and absorb information quicker, that connection to mental illness, obsessive compulsion, insomnia, sickness, um, premature aging, the literature on this subject is surprisingly substantial. We are not meant to live in this style of environment. Our bodies and minds are not connected. They're not wired in that way. Cities exist primarily as a pool of cheap labor for capitalism to use or socialism to use. Either way, that's what a city is. It's a way to keep workers stupid, to keep them under constant surveillance, and to keep them under constant control. And now, when you have every major American city totally wired, totally integrated in a single central video surveillance system, any of our people, and of course this is, this is, you know, increasingly the case in, in the suburbs as well, our people need to leave these areas and to bring our wealth, to bring our expertise to bring our love of the simple life to small town America and assist in the revival of small town America. And in places like Russia and Ukraine, it's far worse, where most of the villages in these parts of the world have been largely depopulated. Only Belarus, thanks to the policies of that government, do you see a growth in small town population and a huge growth in small farm uh, infrastructure and production. So, uh, when we come back from the break, uh, what we're going to do is deal with the economics of the small farm. This is a very important, uh, you know, practical and economic side to this revitalization of small town America and the agrarian life uh, that I advocate. So, hang in there. We'll be right back. Okay, everybody, welcome back to the Orthodox Nationalist. We are dealing with something. Very important. We're dealing with the agrarian life and uh, its significance. We're talking about really the superiority uh, of the agrarian and small town life to the urban and suburban environment, which is created uh, by uh, capital's demand for labor. Uh, the first half of the program, we dealt with really what are the advantages economically and otherwise in small town living. But I want to get, in the second half of the program, I want to get more specific 
and the literature that's out there on this topic, number one, is huge and substantial, and number two, is very little known. And that's really a crime. Um, I, I want to dismiss a myth outright. It's a long-standing myth, and economists for decades believed it. And that is large mechanized farms are more productive and more efficient than small and medium-sized farms. Nothing can be further from the truth. The fact is, is that small farms, farms owned by a single, sort of your average country family, are, according to the World Bank and according to the U.S. Department of Agriculture, between 200 and 1,000 percent more productive per acre than your larger mechanized farms owned by the big, uh, you know, ConAgra and ADM uh, capital organizations. There's a lot of reasons for this. Reason number one, most of your large farms are monocultures. These are uh, huge acreages that are dominated by one crop or one method of farming. Monocultures are highly unnatural. Monocultures are something that corporate America has forced on the land. Monocultures are proven to be unnatural because, number one, the longer you plant the same thing in the same way, the quicker the soil will be depleted. Number two, monocultures attract pests and destruction from outside sources. And as a result of that, um, monoculture farms controlled by ADM and these other kind of organizations are very chemical dependent. There's another reason, though. A lot of people forget about this. And I know a lot of small farmers. I, you know, I'm not saying anything here in these programs that I haven't seen myself. And one of the reasons a lot of people ask me why I ended up going to Nebraska Lincoln for my PhD, well, I got accepted to all kinds of major places on the East Coast. And I refused to go. One of the reasons I refused to go, it was unbelievably expensive. And I don't want to live in New England or New Jersey. It's too expensive and taxes are too high. I go out to Nebraska and I get the exact same education that I'd get at Princeton or the University of Massachusetts for a tenth of the price. Why wouldn't I go out there? It's the same education. You know, there are no secret books at Princeton that no one else is allowed to read. It's all the same books and it's all the same papers and it's all the same exams. It doesn't make any difference whether you go to the University of Wyoming or Harvard. It's the exact same books and the exact same people and the exact same ideas. And whether one school is more difficult than another is based on whether the individual professor is more difficult. You have easy professors at Harvard and you have very difficult professors at the University of North Dakota. It's not a university policy. It's a professor policy. So this whole thing, you know, you get a better education at Harvard than you do at, at, at Oregon is absolutely ridiculous. There is no evidence one way or the other. It's all the same stuff no matter where you go. So given that information, I said, well, I want to go to a place where I can live in a less expensive, low-tax, rural-style environment. And that's exactly what I did. And, and you know, all these years later, uh, I wouldn't have done it any other way. There's another reason why small farms are more productive and simply produce better stuff in terms of quality. And that is because the quality of the labor in small farms and lower medium-sized farms is far superior than usually the migrant labor that you get at the big ADM and ConAgra farms. An individual, a family owning a farm, it is a labor of love. I, for all the farmers that I've met in my life, whether they be cattle, whether they be uh, uh, grain and rye, whether it be uh, dairy, no matter what kind of farmer you're talking about, I have never met a farmer that wasn't happy in their work. 
they were insecure. They were afraid that, you know, they couldn't pay their debts or that ADM was going to move in and destroy everything. But in terms of their daily work, they are a very happy, very satisfied group of people. It is a very rewarding form of labor. It's hard work, but it's very healthy work. It's not weird to go into rural Nebraska, and and I've seen this with my own eyes a million times, guys in their mid-80s working very hard uh, repairing fences, working on cars and trucks, working out in the fields. These guys are physically active. Uh, their diet is far better, and as a result, they are healthier people. And so in the mid-80s, to be strong and to be working on this kind of stuff isn't that outrageous. It's not that crazy. I've seen it all the time. The form of labor that exists at small farms is a completely different style of labor than exists in the large farms. Small farms, you're dealing with family labor, friends and neighbors. Occasionally, you'll find like a part-time worker, usually an older guy who may have sold his farm, and he kind of works part-time in a few different places. I've actually seen that quite a bit. On the other hand, in a big farm, what you're looking at is migrant labor, guys brought in from Mexico and Guatemala and everything else um, uh, to, to, to uh, work for slave wages on the farm. Large farms, you know, when, when the ADM or ConAgra or one of these related groups, when they move into a small ta- uh, town to take over the labor, to take over the farmland, they destroy the town. This is something that the U.S. Department of Agriculture has noted more than once, and internationally, the International Monetary Fund has noted this more than once. That a large farm, when they move into a small town, will destroy the small town, they will replace the native labor with immigrant labor who will work cheaper. This happens not just in America and Canada. It happened in Brazil. It's happened all over the world. The World Bank and the IMF have also noted something else about the nature of small farms. We talk about small farms. We're talking about the real essence of what the agrarian world is. This diffused idea of property ownership. Where more people own small plots of land rather than one or two people owning huge plots of land. Those are two different worlds. Those are two different economies. The former is the agrarian world. The latter is this idea that mechanization and technology should take over farming with a far lower quality, both in terms of the produce, very low quality compared with small farms as well as the quality of labor itself and the happiness of labor. Small farmers are happy people. It's rare to find mental illness, uh, schizophrenia, insomnia, premature aging. For these people who own their own farms, these kind of things are very, very rare. Why? Well, they're out in the open air all the time. They're breathing healthy things. They're eating healthy things. They have usually a lot of friends. They have a, a close-knit neighborhood. There is a connection between clean air and a clean mind. I know it sounds trite, but it's true. There is a close psychological connection between the, the, the quality of the air you breathe and the food you eat and how your mind operates. There's no doubt about it. It's, it's a very common sense kind of a thing. That whenever you've had this kind of a um, redistribution of land to small farmers, you have a high degree of uh, um, all the statistics that reflect well-being. Uh, income, happiness, security, cooperation, increase in, in health and health services. Whenever a big farm outfit moves into a small town, not only is the town destroyed, but all of a sudden, the drug dealers move in, and the pimps move in. All of a sudden, you get the farm people eating this terrible diet of, 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 of you know, Twinkies and, and Coca-Cola. That's what mechanization has brought to the rural environment. But the World Bank has made it clear that wherever you have a highly diffused 
level of property ownership, you have a prosperous local economy and you have, have a prosperous national economy. It's not an accident that so many of your success stories in the third world like South Korea or Taiwan are based on initially a very widely diffused form of uh, property ownership, what we would call the yeoman farmer. That wherever you have widespread land owning, you have prosperous people. Wherever you have a wide distribution of land holding, you have a healthy, intelligent, motivated people. Something else I should note um, about the distinction between small and large farmers. Most of the subsidies, about 70% of the subsidies from the DOA, the Department of Agriculture, goes to corporate farms. ADM and ConAgra are financed by the federal government. Uh, as a result of their subsidies, they are terrible stewards of the land. Small farms produce very little waste because even the sewage system can be used for biofuel. You know, so instead of like when you when you go through Manhattan, um, you know, I used to live very close to New York City. Uh, you see sewage, you know, pouring out onto the streets sometimes. In in uh, in 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 places like rural Nebraska, some of that sewage is actually used to fertilize the land. It's also biofuel that can be used for its its hydrogen, uh, and it can be used for its um, uh, energy. It's, it's a tremendous, it's a beautiful cycle. For a city dweller, it might sound disgusting, but of course, you city dwellers will go out and you'll see sewage in the streets and think it perfectly normal. I've seen it in Manhattan before. I've seen it in Brooklyn. I've seen it in the Bronx. This is, you know, unfortunately, it's, it's normal. And in the cities of the third world, they're essentially drowning in sewage. The fact is, Small, uh, large farms, ADM, ConAgra. Small, uh, large farms are destroying the topsoil. About 90% of American topsoil is now gone. This is because large farms have bought up the farmland and have no incentive to husband their resources because they're being subsidized by the federal government. Most farm subsidies are going to these mega farms, and as a result, because they're being subsidized, they have no incentive. The waste just gets dumped into lakes, and oh well, they're all ignorant yokels anyway, so who cares if they die? And that's so common in uh, you know the Jewish entertainment industry in this country. The ignorant country people, um, they probably should die off anyway, you know. And so ConAgra dumps all this crap in the water. They have no, all the intense chemical, um, uh, it's really chemical culture. It's not agriculture. And, uh, they have, um, they have destroyed the land. They have destroyed the topsoil. And if they continue to expand into f- small farm areas, they will exhaust the topsoil of this country. In the last 50 years, 90% of the topsoil is now gone. It'll take another few decades for the last 10% to be destroyed, and in which case only highly chemical-intensive farming will be able to produce any food in this country. The fact is that small farms are tightly integrated. You usually have, at least in the American Midwest, you usually have different cultures happening at the same time. You have agriculture, you have cattle and dairy, and then you have your typical, you know, oats and barley and rye growing. And as a result of that kind of diversity, you have uh, less need for chemicals because you have far fewer pests, and you have a great degree of labor satisfaction with their work. It's not mechanized factory labor like it is in Archer Daniels Midland or in how the Soviet Union tried to mechanize agriculture. It is the real agrarian environment. And so small farm labor quality is far higher uh, than you have in the um, more centralized 
uh, mega farming. The integration of the small farm is producing higher quality at every level. Labor, uh, income, job satisfaction, and this general happiness that comes from the small farmer's existence. The only real stress is that Archer Daniels Midland is going to come in and destroy the area. Now, here's the thing. As the years go on, as agricultural capital gets more and more expensive, and I, you know, I'm including chemicals and things like that uh, in the process, you have areas in America where capital is very expensive, labor is very cheap. The fact that labor is cheap is no big deal because these are very low cost of living areas. So it doesn't make any difference. You know, in central Nebraska, a $20,000 a year salary is a substantial salary. And you could live fairly well making twenty grand a year. When you have places where capital is expensive and labor is inexpensive, that is a place where small farmers can thrive. So it's not over. This battle is not over yet. Archer Daniels Midland needs to be confronted by the federal government and needs to be broken up and their land redistributed to small farmers. I say that to increase production. I say that to increase the labor happiness and labor quality of small farms. I say it also to decrease the amount of chemicals and destruction of the topsoil and destruction of the agrarian infrastructure that Archer Daniels Midland has brought wherever they have gone. Wherever ADM has gone, they have destroyed the land, they have eliminated the topsoil, they have destroyed the aquaculture of the area, they bring in third world laborers uh, who live on site. So they're essentially squatters getting pennies a day. This is slavery. This is absolute slavery, except in this case, the slave owner doesn't have to feed and clothe their labor. Wherever ADM and ConAgra goes, this kind of destruction happens, and they're doing it with federal money. These groups need to be sued, and their land needs to be redistributed to small farms. Small farms are better, they're happier, their produce is superior in terms of quality, and their productivity per acre can reach up to a thousand percent greater than in ADM's farms because of their lack of um, interest in monoculture. So, I mean, you know, I'll repeat it again. You have this irony where Archer Daniels Midland will dump its grain into the third world at below market prices. As a result, will destroy the small farmer in the third world, and then ADM will bring this now out-of-work small farmer into America to work for slave wages on its mega farms. And frankly, I'm sick and tired of these well-connected globalist agricultural organizations getting away with this. They've been doing it for decades. Archer Daniels Midland has been at the forefront of globalism, global taxes, the centralization of food supply, the development of all of these chemicals, and their chemicals really are only needed just because of their irrational farming techniques, not because they're necessary for the production of food. Small farms are far more productive per acre than the big farms are, according to every authority on the subject. ADM has been in, is, is, uh, is at every Bilderberg meeting. They're represented on the Trilateral Commission. They're everywhere. And they are creating a universe where food is not being produced from the ground at all. As they have eliminated most of American topsoil through their irrational uh, farming habits, as they have done all of that, they are now at the forefront of creating a completely centralized, artificial food uh, production mechanism that, quite frankly, doesn't need the topsoil that they have done so much to destroy. But there is, there are reasons to be optimistic. Our people should be involved in moving to small, uh, small towns and rural areas and using our expertise to support small farmers. 
small farmers can afford, you know, in, 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 you know, the land in rural areas is generally not expensive. When ADM moves in, of course, they drive land prices up, which actually gives more and more incentive for people to sell their homes and move to the city. But land can be used now for wind and hydropower. Land can be used now for growing biomass crops. Even waste products can be used. Garbage can be used for biomass. Ethanol um, has revitalized corn growers. And small farmers can now grow corn for the ethanol plant and, you know, can actually make some diesel. The, the, the alternative energy movement and industry can, in and of itself, revitalize small towns and the small farms. The, the only problem is is that the ADMs of the world uh, are in a better position to take advantage of that. That doesn't mean that the small farmers can't get their piece of this pie. What small farmers have to do is pool their resources and sue ADM and sue ConAgra uh, using the antitrust statutes in hopes that they could be broken up like the telephone industry was broken up uh, a few years ago, about 20 years ago now, and that that land be redistributed to uh, small farmers. And I think that that so many of our issues, so many of our problems can be resolved through the revitalization of small towns and that civic life, that powerfully communal civic life that exists even today in small town America it is absolutely essential. So uh, I want to thank everybody for, for listening. I appreciate your support, and I will talk to you next time. Bye-bye.